everybody and welcome to this amazing session for the Future Print Virtual Summit. Today I have the privilege to introduce you to Elizabeth Gooding. Co-author of the Designer's Guide to Inkjet, Elizabeth has a rare ability to do industry issues from many perspectives. She has managed creative teams on complex design projects, selected outsources for major brands and helped print organizations to retool their operations focus their market positioning and educate their sales teams to really accelerate growth. Previously, she established the first software as a service platform for customer communications. She has also consulted on product positioning for numerous OEMs and software firms. And at inkjetinsight.com, Elizabeth works with a team of top analysts to translate those experiences into tools, data, and content to help print organizations evaluate the potential of inkjet, optimize their operations, work effectively with designers, and grow pages profitably. She is also a founding member of the Inkjet Summit Advisory Board, the co-author of an award-winning book on designing for Inkjet, and a curious consultant, constantly seeking innovative ways to help designers and marketeers hone their craft and drive new pages onto Inkjet presses. So what will she be talking to you wonderful delegates today about? Well, High-speed inkjet has been in the express lane to profit on specific segments, but those lanes are already getting pretty congested. Many new inkjet models make it possible to go fast and also change lanes or pursue different types of work more easily. As inkjet has expanded its reach from transaction printing and direct mail into book production and commercial printing, these segments have begun to blur and overlap. This session will now look at how companies in different segments of printing are using Inkjet to evolve their business models and provide insight into the technical and cost consideration for changing lanes. So without further ado, Elizabeth, thank you very much for joining us today and over to you. Brendan, thank you so much. Um, I say one of the keys to success is working with people who are way smarter than you, which is what I do at Inkjet Insight. Uh, and it's really an honor to be here at the Future Print Virtual Summit. So thank you for having me. Looking right. forward to talking to everyone today. All right, so thank you everyone for being here with me for Is Changing Lanes with Inkjet a Competitive Advantage? I'm really honored to be here at the Future Print Virtual Summit with so many great speakers this week. And let's jump right in and talk about what's going on with Inkjet. I mean, Inkjet in production, Inkjet particularly, is really designed as an express lane. Early on, Inkjet thrived in application segments that were already using digital print. It was a way to drive efficiencies, drive down costs, um, and make things go faster. So you're able to do more work with uh, less printers, less people, less space, and it was tremendously successful in those areas. But it was really designed to do one thing really well. You bought a press for a particular purpose, and the workflow tended to be pretty rigid. So there's still a lot of specialty presses that are designed to do one thing well, but there's also continuous presses now with advanced inks, advanced dryers, advanced heads, wider color gamut, et cetera, that really can span and do more things. Um, they can print on a much wider range of media as well. And with sheet fed presses, particularly the, the B3 plus presses that can have multiple papers in them at the same time, um, they may not be as fast as continuous, uh, but they're still an express lane as compared to the toner devices. Um, they don't have the scale of cost efficiency, but they still provide really an express lane relative to some of the competition. So they're faster, they're more efficient than toner. They can do a lot. So the question is, if, if inkjet is such an express lane and you can, you, know, you can specialize and do one thing really well, um, why would you consider changing lanes, right? If it's so great, why do anything different? Well, quite frankly, some people don't have any choice. Uh, let's face it, a lot of the print markets are currently in decline and you know, you gotta be looking around and trying to do something different. Um, you know, sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a longer term decline or some people you know, this year faced a pretty sudden crash in what they were doing. Most often, um, however, companies who own, already own continuous inkjet or even sheet fed in, inkjet to a smaller degree are just looking around for a way to grow volume because the economies of scale are so tremendous with inkjet. 
the more volume you put on it, the more cost effective they are, the, the total cost of ownership comes down very, very quickly. Um, but you know, there's other factors involved too. So if you consider rather than doing just one thing like transaction print, direct mail, a particular aspect of commercial, if you can do more things or serve more verticals, more types of customers, it's a great deal of risk mitigation. So when you find these situations where one segment or another is down, you have a lot more opportunity to rebound, to pivot, um, to be able to do different things and not be hit quite as hard. And we'll look at some examples of those in a minute. But there's another factor as well, and that's overall customer loyalty. As I'm sure many of you have seen, um, large brands, large companies, they prefer to work with a smaller number of vendors. They want companies who can do more for them. So where you have the opportunity to drive more business to your existing customers, that's the easiest way to get new business. It's the easiest way to grow. So, and just, you know, generally growth is a key way that you want to, um, that you want to look at growing. So I recently wrote uh, a story about Thomas Printworks um, called From Business Cards to Buildings. Um, you know, they're incredibly diversified. Uh, they don't even talk about themselves as being in a particular application segment. They look at trying to do as much as possible for their customers as they can. So they have different types of presses, not just inkjet, but other types of presses. Um, and they look at all of the type of business that they can bring, literally from printing uh, business cards to wrapping buildings, large signage, uh, event wraps, all kinds of different things that they do in between. So, okay, so what happens if you don't change lanes? Let's, let's look at, you know, kind of what's potentially compelling. Well, we talked about the fact that a lot of uh, print markets are in decline, but if you're not, you know, maybe you're lucky enough to be in a, a growth market and you've got a, a broad enough client base, then perhaps you just continue do, doing what you're doing. You look at tuning your workflow, continuing to drive efficiencies, and you can just carry on doing what you've done so well. But if you're in a flat or a declining market, there can be steep penalties for not having the flexibility to do more than one thing. So there's several experts uh, speaking at the summit that have, you know, great research into the impact of COVID on various print markets. I can talk about that in more depth, so, so I won't bel belabor it here. But clearly there have been winners and losers. Um, signage and packaging saw a big surge. Uh, companies mailing bills and statements were fairly stable or even up if they were handling notices. But many segments had a significant downturn. And while it seems like this year lasted forever and is still going, um, these economic issues are not unique to the pandemic. Many of us have lived through internet bubbles, financial service bubbles, nat natural disasters that have impacted insurance and their spending. So this is not a once in a lifetime event that something could happen to the industry that you're working in that would cause you to have a sudden and fairly significant downturn in volume. So, and again, in general, many of the sectors that we're serving are in decline. So if you think about it, there's really only three ways to grow in a declining market, inkjet or not. You know, you're either going to, uh, you know, eat up some companies and get their volume and grow that way. You're going to position yourself to be eaten um, by someone who wants to grow their pages, or you've got to evolve and, and move into markets that are growing and do more than one thing for your customer. So our industry as a whole is going to need to adapt and evolve. We're gonna to have to grow some legs, uh, dip our toes into some other market segments or new service areas altogether. Um, and a lot of print companies are already, uh, they're already evolving. Your competition doesn't necessarily look the way that it used to look. So let's talk about um, Inkjet in a couple of different segments. So um, here's some data from IT strategies looking back at worldwide production sites in 2019. Um, 20, 2018, we published in 2019, 2018 data. Um, at that time, around 25% of transaction print sites had production inkjet. And about 15 to 20% of direct mail sites had inkjet. But here's the really important part. 
uh, of those 25% of transaction print sets, uh, print sites that had inkjet, they control about 50% of the page volume, actually probably closer to 57% of the page volume. Um, and the direct mail sites, the 15 to 20 percent that have inkjet control 40 percent of the page volume. I mean, that's crazy, right? So a minority is, is controlling the, the majority of the volume. So that means companies that don't have inkjet are really getting squeezed out. And if you look on the right-hand side of the slide in terms of inkjet, toner, and offset in terms of the page volume share by print technology, um, in transaction print, uh, the big companies have gotten inkjet. There's still smaller companies with toner, so they've got a little bit to go after in terms of toner volume. Um, on the direct mail side, um, inkjet has already uh, taken the, the low-hanging fruit, certainly, off of toner, and now they're looking at um, you know, going after some of that offset volume. So um you know direct mailers with inkjet they need more volume now transaction printers need more volume now and they're going to have to look in new places because the the you know the easy aspects of getting the quick efficiencies um you know that's that's already been done so so basically what you're seeing is that inkjet and the quest for volume in a declining market is really driving evolution and we're already seeing that. So as these companies who have inkjet are looking for volume in new places, or companies who have lost uh, business to competitors who have inkjet are looking for volume in new places, um, the companies are already taking on different types of work. So particularly in direct mail and transaction printing, uh, and this data is from the US, not worldwide, in 2019, uh, we analyzed data on 120 direct mail companies in the U.S. and Canada, and only 17% of those companies earned more than 80% of the revenue from direct mail services. Okay, so they call themselves a direct mailer, but only 17% of them were doing 80%. <laughs> but in fact, 70% of those direct mailers earned more than half of their revenue outside of direct mail production. So they're already doing a lot of other things. Similar results with transaction printers. So out of 60 companies, only 28% earned more than 80% of their revenue from transaction printing services. That's a little bit less surprising in transaction print because um, they typically will also have online services, e-bill delivery, that type of thing, as well as a lot of programming. Um, but still that's, you know, 28% is a pretty big number. Um, and then again, 58% earned more than half of their revenue outside of transaction printing. And that's, that's the more significant number. So there's also companies in other areas like financial printing who've been impacted by, um, by regulations. So in the US, the companies who are printing proxies, prospectuses, annual reports, that type of thing, had to look for new volume in new places because a couple of years ago there were regulatory changes that made it much easier for companies to provide that information uh, online. So I talked recently talked to a company that used to be primarily a financial printer, um, and they said that they had gotten rid of 80% of their offset fleet because of these regulatory changes. Their volume dropped that much, um, but they also had a wide variety of inkjet uh, presses. Uh, a bunch of uh, Rico, Canon, Rollfed, SheetFed, um, and plenty of warning of the regulatory changes. So they were able to change lanes and they were able to do new things. And, you know, they took a hit, but they came out of it okay. They survived. So let's talk a little bit more about commercial print and graphic arts. Um, commercial print is the, the mostly untapped market for inkjet, and everybody wants a slice of that pie. So the vast majority of that volume is still produced on offset presses, um, but some commercial printers are starting to get into the inkjet game, um, primarily because of um, the major advances that have come along in terms of uh, ink formulation that's allowed the presses to uh, print on a wider variety of media, including offset media, light and heavy media. Um, uh, and the coverage and the color gamut that they can now achieve has, has in some cases, exceeded offset gamuts. So that's really driving it. Um, 
However, a lot of these commercial printers, you know, they're not just hoping to convert their, um, you know, their, their offset volume onto these inkjet presses. Um, they're also looking at competing in adjacent markets. So for years we had transaction print and direct mailing that have been, you know, pulling various volumes away from commercial print. And boy, those commercial printers would be more than happy to try to have some of that go in the other direction for a change. So um, they may look at, uh, you know, workbooks, directories, uh, you know, other areas that that direct mail and transaction companies may be trying to you know, change lanes and capture some of that share themselves. So once they have an inkjet press, they want to keep it busy and they'd rather take a turn at grabbing someone else's volume than just cannibalizing their own. So, okay, let, let's say for a minute that, that you believe that, that doing more for your customers, that being more flexible and changing lanes could provide you with competitive advantage. It's not necessarily that easy to change lanes, right? So even though you may have an inkjet press that's capable of doing a wide variety of things that can you know, go fast at one level of performance, very, very fast, um, that you can um, also print super high quality, um, that you've got a, you know, either a sheet fed or a wide enough roll that you can be flexible in terms of the, the types of finishing equipment that you can drive out to. Um, even if the equipment does what you want it to do, that doesn't mean that your organization understands the different application segments, understands what your customers need, and can really go after this effectively. So, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, maybe direct mailers who have added aspects of transaction printing to their business, they have needed much more robust programming and data protection if they're going to go into those markets, as well as more finishing and mailing equipment than they typically had. Um, transaction printers who are going on, you know, going beyond low coverage, business color types of applications and envelope mail, they need to learn a lot more about color than they knew before. Um, they also need to be selling into a different segment. They're not necessarily going after those operations people. They've got to get to marketing and other, and other groups. So direct mailers and transaction printers, are they're competing with increasing frequency, but they're also merging. So we're seeing a lot of direct mail and transaction print companies come together. As commercial printers start to look at other types of work that overlaps with transaction printers and direct mailers, directories, workbooks, notices, uh, or if they, you know, get that uh, data capability, they may, you know, get into aspects of, of more data-driven work. Um, they also may be competing based on a different level of quality than they typically had before. So they need to make sure that they're price competitive. So in all of these cases, you know, companies that think they understand color, they need to really understand the color capabilities of inkjet and their particular device and how that is different from or complementary to their existing portfolio. So they may have to test more media, more, um, and develop more profiles per media that they support. Because, you know, ink is just, I mean, it's liquid gold, right? Um, delivering top quality color is much more expensive than delivering, you know, business color or just as good color, or putting color only on the page for a logo, even if it's, you know, wonderful, you know, uh, tight color delivery, if it's a very limited space, you wanna price that cost competitively. So they have to understand the, um, the cost, the pricing model, the workflow, et cetera, that goes around that to make sure that they can deliver in a competitive way against companies who've been working there in quite, in, uh, in, you know, as their standard core model. Um, they also need to educate their sales teams uh, to understand that so that they're selling and setting the appropriate expectations for who they're selling to. They need to learn more about the customers that they're going after, after, whether that's a new department within an existing customer or a completely new segment. And they also need to set expectations with the customers of what those offers are now. So, and you know, you may also be looking at evaluating new equipment. So it may be that if you have a, an, original gen, uh, an original generation or early generation of inkjet press, that's very fast and it has been serving you very well in a certain aspect of transaction printing or direct mail, and you suddenly find yourself going after business where you may be competing with 
commercial printers or a higher end uh, direct mailer, the equipment you have may not do the trick. So you may need to replace the device, upgrade the device. In many cases, uh, we're seeing uh, customers come out, or not customers, I'm sorry, OEMs, uh, come out with field upgradable options to their presses, which will allow you to get to a, you know, a higher level of quality or speed or both without replacing the entire press. So those are all things that you want to look at. Um, but there's also, as we said, situations where people are acquiring also, they want to change lanes. So they're saying, uh, we're going to buy that expertise. We're going to buy some of that volume. We're going to buy some of that capability. So case in point recently is um, the uh, Colroyd Group. And if you're familiar with Semeta, they're uh, out of Belgium. They're a really interesting company. Uh, they were the in-house production company for Colroyd Group, and they're producing all of their retail work using Offset um, just a few years ago. And then um, they invested in Inkjet, a uh, large production Inkjet, and they ended up actually completely changing their business model, getting rid of all of their Offset presses, and successfully selling to other businesses. So they went from being a kind of an in-house not-for-profit shop to being a very competitive for-profit shop, producing not only the retail work for Colroyd, but doing um, all kinds of interesting new applications in the insurance sector, et cetera. So in, in, um, in August of this year, Colroyd acquired Yoast Hybrid in order to evolve and be able to do more for their customers. And Yoast Hybrid specializes in printed electronic, printed and electronic customer communication. So basically, transaction print and e-delivery. So putting Semeta and Yoast Hybrid together allows the company to do more for their existing customers and grow their business. Um, they're also in a stronger position to pursue new business outside of both of their existing customers. And um, I can tell you, you know, both companies, lovely people, very smart, and looks like it's a, you know, it's a, a great situation. But what I see many times with companies who are pursuing acquisitions is it's more of a roll up of the same type of capability. So they, they, you know, they, they roll up sites, um, they lay off a bunch of people, um, and they still end up just being able to do one thing. It doesn't really evolve their capability to do more for the customer. So think about, you know, if you are uh, either in the situation of looking to be acquired or acquiring companies, think about complementary businesses, not just businesses that do what you do, particularly if you are in a market that's declining. Rolling up a bunch of declining volume is, is you know, it's, it's just a, a slow, you know, very, very slow process of going in the same direction, not, not particularly helpful. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, change is hard, right? Um, very few people like change, but it's hard at the best of times. If you're not incenting the right behavior, it's just about impossible to get businesses and people to change. So you have to really think about being very clear where you're going, what you're trying to do, and how you're going to get everybody going in the same direction. There are lots of companies who have already, they've identified profitable business areas that they could go into, but they didn't really embrace the change. And you, you see this, you see this with transaction printers who they offer e-delivery, but it's managed in a different group. Uh, you know, they, they don't, you know, they, they want to tout the technology that they can offer, but they don't necessarily provide their customers with the service to really drive down paper, which is, which is what the customers want. They want to, they want to do as little paper as they possibly can. So you have to be expert. If you want to be an e-delivery, you have to be expert at helping companies to get off paper. And that's a, that's a hard culture to make happen. Similarly with direct mail companies, you know, they may offer multi-channel services, but many of them don't really embrace social and electronic channels or um, they're managed in a different group than the print. So the print operations are the print operations. And sometimes it's a different selling group. Sometimes it's a different management group. Um, but they aren't all incented in the same direction. 
And if you look at the commercial print world, you know, there's many companies who've clung, clung to the belief that inkjet color will, will never match what they can do on offset. It'll never be fast enough or that there just isn't that much of a market for it. It's really not going to, you know, it's not going to come after much of their work because there's just really customers don't really want that, do they? You know, it sounds very much like the big mainframe manufacturers, uh, you know, IBM, Hewlett Packard, Digital Equipment Corporation back in 1971 talking about the idea of a personal computer. I mean, who would want that, right? Who would want a personal computer? Can't be a very big market for it. So one of the things that really struck me a few years ago, um, some early research from IT strategies when, um, gosh, about seven or eight years ago when Marco Bohr and I were working on the first Ink Inkjet Summit, and their research said that 35% of the page volume on Inkjet, and it was all continuous at that time, 35% um, of that volume was not cannibalizing pages from other types of devices. It was actually net new pages that people found that they could do new things uh, more cost effectively that they couldn't do. So more personalized types of applications that really weren't done before. Personalized welcome kits, um, directories. I mean, they, they look similar, but they weren't replacing another type of document or another document that was printed elsewhere. So people who are using applications or using inkjet to create applications to grow, um, you know, that's really, that's where you want to be. We need to keep our eyes open for new applications and new opportunities. But um, the fact is still that a lot of, uh, you know, inkjet volume will be pulling from other processes. And, you know, in many cases, it will be helping us cannibalize our own business. And, you know, the biggest and most profitable opportunities are actually going to come from disruption. And if you aren't part of the process of disruption, it's going to run right over you. So this goes for OEMs as well. Many print OEMs are in the same boat, right? They're, they're cannibalizing very, very profitable bases of toner equipment with the inkjet. Um, you know, some companies, some OEMs are organized more effectively to allow this change to happen, and others are clearly protecting aspects of their installed base. The problem is that someone else is going to be very happy to sell to that installed base. So there has to be an incentive to change. Um, I'll give you another example outside of the industry. You know, quite a few years back, there was a research uh, analyst, Char uh, Craig Venter, who was working on the Human Genome Project, and he was actually working at the National Institutes of Health. And they had something like three, you know, $3 billion in funding or some ridiculous amount of funding that was going to go through 2005. And he figured out a way to use personal computers to cut, you know, years off the process of this research. And they looked at him and said, why would we do that? We're funded through 2005. So he got frustrated and left and started doing the research himself and, you know, got to the point where he was going to release be ready to release research and NIH ended up having to come back to him and negotiate to try to, uh, um, you know, deliver it as a joint project since he had started there. So, you know, just because you're not willing to change doesn't mean somebody else isn't ready to just run around you and take that opportunity away from you. So, you know, another example, since, you know, since we're at FuturePrint, we got to talk about future stuff, right? Um, let's look at, at space, okay? Why did it take so long to come up with a reusable rocket as SpaceX has done? Well, again, back to incentives because the whole space industrial complex was making billions of dollars not having a reusable rocket. So I've been reading this great book by Andrew Main. It's on the economics of making money through space exploration. He's actually a sci-fi guy who decided to kind of write a, a business economics book um, you know, because of his love of all the science parts of it. Um, and it, it's great. It's great reading. I highly recommend it. So he makes the point that that NASA, uh, Roscosmos, all the other government run space programs, they weren't founded with the goal of making a profit. Um, the people who work there weren't incented to do things necessarily faster or cheaper. They were 
you know, tasked with meeting a particular contract in a particular amount of time. And of course, most of the work for those organizations is outsourced to, to private contractors that are, you know, they're, they're very profit motivated, but they're just waiting for the next contract. It doesn't necessarily help them to, um, to get the contract done sooner. They don't, they don't really have any participation in any upside of the contract. So why would you push to build a reusable rocket when you're getting paid to build a new rocket every year, right? Well, the answer is again, because if you don't look at doing those things, somebody else is gonna do it and take all your business. So Elon Musk said, <laughs> trying to build the space industry on a single use rocket is like trying to build the airline industry on planes that crash on landing. You know, and you know, everybody thought he was nuts. In 2011, he announced that he was gonna be developing um, reusable rocket technology. And pretty much all of the experts at that time, you know, not all, but most, um, they really thought it was impossible. But within five years, just, just five years, they had, um, uh, you know, they had it in, re in reality, they were, it was running. So NASA did their own estimate once they heard his announcement and said, okay, what would it, what would it take to, to build this technology? And NASA estimated that it would have cost about $4 billion and a lot more time to develop the Falcon 9 rocket. SpaceX spent $390 million and developed both the Falcon 9 and the Falcon 1 technology. Um, and I mean, and think about it, in, in, you know, in the time that it takes NASA to get a study done, put an RFQ out, um, get the funding, start the project, SpaceX is already on their third or fourth round of their technology. So they just, you know, you can't, you can't work if you don't have, um, you know, the right incentives and the motivation. So unlike the government funded space programs for SpaceX, the prize, you know, the prize wasn't just bragging rights about, you know, having got to the moon or having got into space or having done what they'd done. Um, they were focused on a business with tremendous profit potential. So they're, they're launching satellites, they're, they're servicing equipment in space, they're laying the groundwork for mining other planets and for you know, mining asteroids and, and even space tourism. So I highly recommend the book. I don't think it was necessarily intended as you know, being a business management primer, but it makes a really good one. Because um, it's, it's not like the engineers at SpaceX were necessarily smarter than the government contractors at Boeing or Lockheed. Um, but SpaceX teams had the, you know, the latitude to work in the most effective way, in the most efficient way, to rethink anything that had gone before, and they're incented to be profitable. They don't have to worry about cannibalizing some existing technology that was there. So, you know, again, this is future print. We got to look to the future. So think about finding your path. And I posed the question at the beginning, is changing lanes with inkjet a competitive advantage? And I would argue that for most print providers and for OEMs, the answer is yes. Um, print providers in declining markets need to look around and see what markets they can enter and how they can do new and profitable things for customers. It's already happening. And if you're not looking around, you're going to be left behind. OEMs need to keep driving inkjet into new application areas, new segments, and keep driving down the maintenance and running costs. And where the OEMs are offering technology outside of inkjet, they really need to rethink the pricing models and click charges if they want to keep those technologies viable as inkjet con continues to take more volume in different areas. And as an industry, we need to be doing new and valuable things. We need to think about doing better things to keep print relevant and valuable. Inkjet is a personalization powerhouse and it coexists to add value to social, mobile, other non-print channels. We can change lanes and add non-print solutions to our repertoire as well. We need to be willing to redesign uh, all of our print products in a way that might reduce the number of pages but increases the value exponentially. There are tremendous opportunities for disruptive redesign in a whole bunch of segments, like statements and billing and magazines and catalogs and packaging and more. Um, there's really cool examples out there now and we can just keep getting better. So 
if you're looking for new growth opportunities for production inkjet, consider looking in some new places. Don't be afraid to disrupt your business because if you don't, somebody else will and they'll just speed right on by you. So that's what I have for today. And now I'd like to hand it back to Brendan to wrap up and tell you more about the event. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was an incredibly interesting, insightful session that I think all of the delegates will take a huge amount away from. I know I certainly did. I'm a massive print geek. Um, and as a quick aside, actually, what you were talking about um, gave me a bit of inspiration and sort of connected something for me that I used to be the editor of a signing graphics uh, magazine in the UK. And it made me think that, um, Sign makers in the 1970s were en masse bending iron, blowing neon, and using paint to make signs. That's, that's, that was their business model. That's what they did. They were creatives in the main. They were artists, and they did all that work with their hands. Fifteen years later, in 1985, en masse, that entire industry was investing in the first wave of wide format inkjet technology um, and using that to empower their businesses. Uh, and if you ask yourself why did an industry that worked almost exclusively with its hands and used no computers whatsoever, then moved en masse and is now actually one of the biggest demand segments for inkjet technology on the planet, is because they were creatives and they quickly realized that their product wasn't bent iron, blown neon and painted signs. Their product was fulfilling their customers' communication needs. And I think our industry and all of the, our sister industries need to embrace that as well, that inkjet and the opportunities it provides is not the technology in and of itself, it's what you can do with it and how you can fulfill those end demands for your customers. That is a, just a, a brilliant example, Brendan. Thank you for wrapping up with that because that is exactly the story. It's about, it's about the solution, not necessarily how you get there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Elizabeth, thank you again for your time. Uh, thank you to all of you out there for consuming and watching this session uh, on the F Future Print Virtual Summit. And we will look forward to seeing you on the next session in just a moment. <laughs>